whenever I think of someone who does it, I think of my brother a lot um, and how he could have just ended up in Highland Park and got <laughs> and become a car dealer or another occupation and how God and Guru sent him on a bigger mission. I think the biggest point is that we all have that mission. To do something bigger and more incredible than you ever thought in human capacity could do. And then just do it. And he's a man who did it. And if he could do it, then we can all do it, right? <laughs> Jai Radha Madhava Kun 
He was with his guru, whose name is Narada. Valmiki asked Narada that for my spiritual progress, I need a hero in my life that I could really emulate. Can you tell me about someone with such character that they have deep compassion for all beings, very self-controlled, inner, with inner contentment. They have no tendency to find faults with anyone, but a person who loves to find the good in everyone. A person who just generates love and kindness in whoever he does. Can you tell me about such a person? And his Guru Narada thought about one particular person. And he became so ecstatic thinking about this person that he said, I have to meditate for some time. And like a volcano eruption, there was ecstasy coming from Narada's heart, just thinking about this person. And he came back to Valmiki and said, I'm going to tell you the story of Rama. You heard of Rama? He's an incarnation of the Supreme Lord. A 
just about 92 verses. A description of Ram's life. And later on, Valmiki composed the Ramayana, which is 24,000 verses. 640 chapters, six books, 24,000 verses. So after he heard this from his guru, he went back to his ashram. Now Valmiki had many, many disciples. Some of the greatest sages of history were his followers. And with one of his chief followers named Bardwaj, he said, let us go to take our bath in the Ganges River. They were walking to the Ganges to take their bath. And something happened to Valmiki. He said, let's bathe somewhere else today. There's another river called the Tamasa. And they went to the Tamasa River. And just when they were going in the river, Valmiki was explaining how a pure river is like the mind of a noble person. It's very pure always flowing in, in the direction that's well meant for the welfare of everyone. And rivers, they provide the water for the agricultural fields to grow crops. They're places for people to bathe. They're the source of people's water for cooking and for drinking. And throughout history, rivers are the lifeline is why today one of the rivers all over the world, especially India, the Gang Ganga, the Ganges, and the Yamuna, the pollution of the rivers really should be a main priority for humanity at large because it's so destructive to hundreds of millions of lives. Years ago, I'm going to divert from the story, and then I'm going to come back to this one. But if I forget to come back, please remind me. <laughs> I was in the New Delhi airport, and the minister for the environment for the whole country happened to be sitting close by in the waiting lounge, waiting for to board an airplane. She sent somebody to ask if she could come and speak something with me. So I said, yes, of course. A very powerful lady. In fact, she was the daughter-in-law of Indira Gandhi, who used to be the Prime Minister. She said, what are you yogis and sadhus doing for the environment? The rivers are polluted, the air is polluted, the ground is polluted, everything is polluted, and you're just doing your asanas, and you're just doing your meditation, and chanting your mantras, and doing your pujas, and your mudras. What are you doing for the environment? I was really tired. Everything is God's property, so we will use everything 
not in a spirit of exploitation, but in a spirit of seva, or service, with respect. Yes, we have to clean all of the environment you know, through our different policies, but if we don't clean each other's hearts, even if every river and every ocean and every mountain is clean, it will all be polluted again. So we should work together. And just when I said that, she was called to board her. <laughs> and she said, yes, Swamiji, we should work together. And she left. So a clean, flowing river is like the clean, flowing nature of a noble person's heart and mind. So he was having these noble thoughts following me as he went into the river, and then something happened. Something happened that changed the history of humankind. A bird, a beautiful bird, called a croncha. A croncha looks kind of like a crane, and they have a very special quality that the male and the female croncher birds, when they connect to each other and develop affection, they become completely faithful to each other throughout their lives to death. So this female croncher bird was calling for her beloved. And then the male croncher bird came. And while Mickey was seeing the affection of these birds for each other, and he was thinking in his heart that, just see, this tendency, this propensity to love is the inherent nature of every soul. In the Brahma Sutra, there is a verse, Ananda Mayo Bhyashat, which means the absolute truth and all creation, all living beings, our inherent nature is to seek pleasure. And what is the pleasure that we're all seeking? The origin, Paramdraspani Bhartate, the origin of that tendency in all of us. From the little ant crawling around on the kitchen counter, to the prime ministers of nations, everyone is looking for pleasure. The origin is the Atma, the living force, the soul that gives life to everyone. That living force that sees through our eyes and touches through our skin, feels through our hearts and thinks through our brains. That living force, its nature, it's to love God and to experience the infinite love of God, who has many names in this case, Brahma, which means the source of all pleasure. Krishna, the all-attractive one. Vishnu, that means the, the all-pervading presence of the Supreme Being. And that love is our true potential. And we're seeking that love in everything. And it is that love that is that creates the nature, which is the fundamental need of every living being, to love and to be loved. So Valmiki was a great philosopher, and he was seeing these two birds, how they loved each other. They had so much affection for each other. He was just appreciating it so much, their happiness of being reunited. And suddenly, <laughs> through the sky and struck the male bird right in the heart. And blood spurted from his little white body and he fell dead with a scream. And as he was laying there dead, his beloved was agonized. She was weeping, she was crying. She was in complete grief. Seeing this, Valmiki, on 
uncontrollably, his mind exploded with anger. He shouted, Oh, unfortunate hunter, because you have killed this innocent, life-loving bird and caused such grief to his beloved, I curse you. May you suffer condemnation for all the ages to come. May all inauspiciousness fall upon you forever. After he said that, he thought about what he just said, and he really regretted it. Why did I act so extremely? After all, after all, he's a hunter. That's what hunters do. <laughs> he doesn't really know any better. He's just doing what his occupation, probably what his mother and father and grandmother and grandfather, what everybody taught them. Yes, he did something terrible. But why did I curse him in such an extreme way? He was really regretting his own actions. He gave in to anger. And sometimes circumstances in our life come where we react in ways where we don't really use our intelligence beforehand. And then we regret it. And he was such a sensitive person. That curse kept going in his mind again and again and again. But then he began to smile. Because as the curse was going through his mind, and he was even saying it, he realized that in Sanskrit, his words were in perfect tune, meter, rhythm, and prose. He just invented an extraordinary, most beautiful form of poetry, classical poetry. Even though the content was horrible, the package, <laughs> the package in which it came was absolutely sweet. And because of that, he couldn't stop thinking about it. He took his bath. And then he went to teach his students. So many great sages and rishis and yogis, and he's teaching them. And as he's teaching them all kinds of nice things, his mind keeps repeating this curse. And he's thinking such harsh, terrible words I spoke. But I said it so sweet and so nice. <laughs> and I can't forget it. It just captured his own heart. And he was wondering, I can't get this out of my mind. It was so negative. He wanted to get rid of it. But he couldn't because it was, it was so nice. While he was teaching his class, Brahma, one of the greatest of all personalities, came to his ashram. So Brahma is the guru of his guru. He's Narada's guru. So Valmiki was very much um, honored that Brahma has come to my little ashram, the bank of the Ganga, and he welcomed him. And he's looking at Brahma, and in his mind, there's this curse, just repeating again and again and again. And he didn't know what to do. So he said to Brahma, you know, I cursed a bird, I cursed a hunter because he killed these birds and he made this bird suffer so bad. And it's such a terrible curse that I made that, you know, I condemn this person forever and I have the power that what I say happens. But I said it with such sweetness. <laughs> And he recited it to Lord Brahma. And Brahma smiled. He said, your Guru Narada has told you the, the story of Ram. You should compose Ram's whole story in this poetic meter. Just in this style that was revealed to you. And as you sit in your meditation, Everything about Ram's life is going to be revealed to you. And you write it all down in this poetry. And you 
recite it. So from, from that moment, he began to recite the Ramayana in this poetry. And that poetry, even today, is being recited, attracting millions and millions of people. Something terrible became something beautiful. And of course, by his own wish and prayers, he forgave the hunter. And I'm sure the hunter got liberated because he was instrumental in writing the whole Ramayana, the story of Ram's life. And Valmiki was thinking, why of everyone in the world am I being chosen Compose the Ramayana, the story of Ram's life, a story that's going to be a scripture, it's going to be famous, it's going to transform unlimited hearts for the rest of time. Why me? And he began to think of his past. At one time, he was a hunter long ago. That's probably why he got so mad at this hunter. My guru's guru, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada, he wrote that the reason why we see faults in others is because we are honeycombed with faults ourselves. The world is like a mirror of our own mind. If we're envious, we're going to see envy in others. If we're greedy, we're going to see so much greed everywhere. If we love, we're going to see love. If we, if we see God within ourselves, if we see Krishna, we'll see Krishna everywhere. So the world really is so much a mirror of ourself. So Valmiki began to think of the distant past. He was not only a hunter, he was a murderer. He was a highway robber, even though there weren't highways in those days. This is long. There were pathways. He was out hunting and killing when his guru, Narada Muni, happened to be coming through the forest where he was. And as he was shooting arrows at innocent people and creatures, Narada saw that. And he began with a very sweet, compassionate voice. He, he spoke loud enough so that this hunter, at that time his name was Ratnakara. Ratnakara was doing, you know, just, he didn't even consider that he was causing suffering and death. Human psychology can be corrupted so bad when we become so selfish, we don't really think about how it's affecting others. We don't really even care because we're so self-centered, egoistically self-centered. So he never thought about that. It was just all about me. I'm, I'm getting rich by killing all these people and all these animals. I'm maintaining my family. So Narada started speaking real loud in such a nice voice that Ratnakara, don't you think about the reality that there are laws of nature called karma. That how we affect others is going to inevitably come back upon ourselves. Every bit of pain and grief you cause to other people is going to affect you. And he heard this. And because he heard it from somebody who wasn't just chastising him, somebody who really cared about him. 
when there's a teacher who really cares to help you, their words and their concern really go to our heart. It's like my dear brother, Sham Sundar, is sitting in the back in that beautiful golden clothes. And in 1967, in San Francisco, he greeted our guru, Srila Prabhupada, and brought him to Haight-Ashbury to live. Now, this is another story. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada was from the holiest of all holy places for devotees of Krishna in all of India and the world called Vrindavan. He was living there for many years in Seva Kunj, where Krishna performs his Ras Lila, the, the most sacred, intimate place of spiritual revelation, surrounded by holy people. And he came to the West to share the gifts of, his, of that love. And little did he know, much did he know, I don't know. All I know is now he was living in the Bowery for some time after going on a cargo ship for 38 days. He was 70 years old. And from the Lower East Side of New York, a little storefront was created for him. And then he was brought to the West Coast. And the first day he arrived, he was brought to Haight-Ashbury. This is 1967 the summer of love. <laughs> but it's a different kind of love than you bring down. <laughs> so, and, um, Shamsunda, would you like to tell the story? <laughs> He's a much better speaker. But I'm diverting a little more from the diversion. I'm, I'm happy. So, Two years ago, I was here in Los Angeles, and Sham Sundar called me on the phone. And we're speaking, and you know how cell phones are, they do all kinds of things simultaneously. So he said, I have another call, I'll call you, can you hold on? And I kind of suspected it was a special call. So I said, just call me back. He said, I'll call you back in five minutes. Two hours later, he <laughs> He said, you will not believe who just called me. I said, I don't believe you, just tell me. <laughs> he said, I have been looking for this person for 40 years. I said, who is it? He said, Rock Scully. I said, Okay. <laughs> he said, you don't know who Rock Scully is? I said, no, I don't. Would you like to tell him who Rock Scully is? <laughs> he was Sham Sundar's roommate in Switzerland when he was going to college. <laughs> but then he came back to kind of create Hate Ashbury, bought a house, and he was the manager of a band called the Warlocks. What was it? It was called Warlocks or something. He, and he started, and you know, he put this band together and got a house in Haight-Ashbury, and then he renamed them the Grateful Dead. Yeah. <laughs> and then all these other bands, Janis Joplin and Jefferson Airplane and Loving Spoonful and Quicksilver and Moby Gray, they all started coming to the house, and that's how Haight-Ashbury started. Shamsundar was kind of part of that whole scene. I'm not going to go into any more details. <laughs> it's really fascinating. It's one of the founding fathers of the counterculture of Shamsundar. And he, he's, he's writing a book, and he was looking for Rock Scully to interview him. So from Los Angeles, I went to San Francisco, and I, whenever I'm in San Francisco, I just take one day to walk
walk through the redwood forests where there's so many beautiful lessons of Krishna, of God, that he speaks through nature. And when we just go into nature like that, it's incredible what we can learn. So we met Shamsundar in the redwood forests, those mere woods. And he told us that Rak Skalid said about our Guru Srila Prabhupada, that he was one of us. He came and lived in Haight-Ashbury with us. He wasn't just telling us what to do. He was, we were his family, he was our family. Such compassion, such affection, such care. And Shamsunda was telling me and telling us what Rakskali was speaking and what he was also experiencing that when somebody tells you some truths, sometimes we don't like them. <laughs> and sometimes we like them, but we, it's just not for us. But when somebody, you really feel that they love you and they care about you. And that's how that happened. So, Narada Muni spoke to Bhumi, to Ratnakar, the hunter, that don't you understand what's going to happen to you for all the pain you're causing? And Ratnakar said, but I'm doing, he, 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 he stopped because it really affected him. He said, I, what you're saying may be true, but I'm doing it for my family. Narada said, go ask your family if they're willing to share the reactions of your activities. He said, of course they will. I'm giving them so much. Go ask. He went back to his family. He said, you know, I'm causing so much pain and death to so many people to maintain you. You're going to share the reactions, aren't you? They said, never. <laughs> started really thinking about, for the first time in his life, he started really thinking about what he was doing in his life. And he became humble. He became afraid. And he went back to Narada. And he said, please tell me, what can I do to, to reverse what I've done? And Narada told him two things. Stop causing pain to others. There's other ways of surviving. And in the path of bhakti, we transcend negativity by replacing it with positivity. Fill your mind with the beauty and the grace of God by chanting his names. And Ratnakar said, Tell me what names I should chant. And Narada started telling me different names of God. But Valmiki, he was so cruel. He was so evil. He had no capacity to say such a nice thing as God's name. He was trying to chant the mantras, but he couldn't say a single syllable in the mantra correctly. Narada was giving them all. Rama, Krishna, Narasimha, oh, he, he couldn't say them. But he cared so much. You see, love, to actually love someone who's in need, is like becoming a doctor for the heart of that person. You do what works. <laughs> even if it's not so orthodox. So Narada was thinking, this person, his whole life has been dedicated to cause death. So I will have him chant the name of the god of death, which is Mara. Mara means death. 
He said, just chant, meditate on this two syllables, Mara Mara, constantly. And Ratnakar was really, he wanted to cleanse himself. So he sat in meditation, Narada left. He was going, Mara, 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 which means death, death, death. He did this for weeks, for months, for years, just chanting, Mara, Mara, Mara. And after years of singing this and meditating on these vibrations, a kind of a loop took place. Mara, 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 Rama, Rama, Rama. He was chanting Ram's names. And as he was chanting Ram Ram's names with such purity and such, such attention and humility, he became completely saintly. And he was so engrossed in his samadhi of chanting, meditating on the mantra, Rama, 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 that he just became oblivious to the world. And after some time, ants built a hill over him. So he was actually inside of an ant hill. Rama, Rama, Rama. And Narada Muni, years later, came through that forest, and he was looking for his disciple, Ratnakar. And he heard Rama, 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 and he was looking around, where is it coming from? And it's coming from an ant hill. And Ardamuni, with some sacred water, he threw it on the ant hill, and the ant hill kind of dissolved. And there was Ratnakar, Rama, Rama, Rama. And he got up and he saw his guru and felt so blessed. And it was at that time that Ardamuni gave him a new name, Valmiki. Do you know what Valmiki means? Valmiki Muni. Muni means a saint. Valmiki Muni means the saint who emerged from an anthill. <laughs> so he was remembering this. And then he understood why he was chosen. Because he's speaking to people who have been you know, through, through so much in their lives. And Inherently, everyone is good. Inherently, everyone is divine. But the nature of the ego, when it gets implicated and complicated in arrogance, and selfish passions, greed, envy, anger, illusion, so many layers and layers and layers of this internal ecological pollution comes over us, and we forget who we are completely, what our real nature is. But he was there. Just like a person who is a drug addict or an alcoholic. They know what it's like to be a drug addict and alcoholic. So they have a special quality to help somebody who's suffering that if they come out of it themselves. He recognized that his only quality to be who he was and to give what he could give to the world, the ecstasy of love, love for Rama. His power was the forgiveness, the mercifulness, the kindness of his guru. Therefore, he had no false ego. Even though he had thousands and thousands of followers, and even some of the greatest scholars and rishis were his followers, and they were glorifying him, he never became falsely proud because he was fully aware, it's not about me. It's the forgiveness that I received. It's the kindness, the mercy, and the love that I received that has empowered me to do what I'm doing. 
which is God's grace, which has come through God's loving service. And he recognized I'm just an instrument. And I know, I know what illusion is about, and I know what suffering is about. And therefore the Lord is using me as an instrument to reveal his teachings and his beautiful pastimes to the whole world for all time to come. And that is how the Ramayana, the beautiful story, has come to all of us.
Last time we had about how Yogi Bhajan Guru Dave was um, somebody invited him to Canada from India. Yeah. And he was at the airport and he didn't know anybody. And he didn't have anyone's phone numbers and the professor was supposed to pick him up at the airport. And then what happened? So he came out of the airport and there was nobody there to pick him up. And there was no message of where he was just waiting and waiting, yes? And he just kept waiting and waiting and nobody ever came and he never got any message. And finally he met a Sikh gentleman, I think, and they took him to a temple and he was kind of washing dishes and doing just humble services to stay at the temple for some time. And then he started teaching and so he had a worldwide movement. Sometimes the Lord puts special, great personalities in very helpless situations just to te teach us that Valmiki is living in an anthill. Popa <laughs> was living in Haight Ashbury. <laughs> Yogi was washing dishes in his little temple. So, great personalities are put through these kind of situations to show us how, you know, through all challenges and through all reversals, something beautiful can happen in our lives and we can offer something glorious to the world. If we just, you know, connect to that grace that is beyond ourselves, that higher power. <clears throat> so, Srila Prabhupada Guru used to tell us that a happy life is one of simple living and high thinking. That means whether we're billionaires or whether we're living in a little cottage in a farm. That's not what's going to make us happy. Simple life means in whatever situation we're in, we understand everything is God's property. Let me use it with compassion. That's high thinking. High thinking is to understand our own true spiritual identity. And, and when we connect with that spiritual identity, we understand our relationship with Vidyavanaya sampani brahmani gabihastu suni chai pusupake cha pandita samadarshana. The true wisdom according to Bhagavad Gita is to see every living being with equal vision. Whether one is of a particular race or religion or sex or color or even species. Wherever there's life, there is a sacred child of God. And when you water the root of the tree, that water naturally extends from every part of the tree. And when we, when we awaken our own spiritual potential, our own love for the Supreme, we call Krishna, the all-attractive, then that naturally extends to every living being. Aham bija pratapita. Just this morning I was listening to a lecture where my Guru Dave was saying that it doesn't matter what religion that you follow or what spiritual path. He said, you may be a Hindu, you may be a Christian, you may be a Jew, you may be a Muslim, you may be a Buddhist. The real thing is, how are you awakening your love for, for God within ourselves? And how we see, how we see the presence of a child of God in every living being. That's high thinking. And simple living means when in whatever situation we're in, 
This is what motivates us. So he taught us that Mother Nature is providing so many beautiful gifts. And in our theology, the one absolute truth both has a male and female aspect. Sita Ram, Lakshmi Narayan, Parvati Shiva, Radha Krishna. This is the, the female aspect of the Lord is the compassionate, loving, motherly aspect. And the male aspect is the powerful, creative aspect. And according to our scriptures, Bhumi Devi, Bhumi is the name of Mother Earth. She's an expansion of the feminine divinity. Sita was born from the earth. According to the Brahmanda Purana, Radha was also born from the earth. Because the earth is, is their own energy. In this way, we call Mother, Mother Earth. Because we're all like little babies, whoever we are. We're completely dependent on our mother. Just like a little infant. They cry for their mother. If the mother doesn't feed them, if the mother doesn't pretend, then they cannot survive. It's really an incredible situation to be a mother. Where this little person is 100% totally dependent on you. When you're in the womb, of, when you're in your womb, there's nothing anybody else is going to do for them. So we're all like that with Mother Earth. She provides air and food and water and sunshine and everything. So to honor and respect the divine presence of God in nature is a very important part of the Vedic perspective of spirituality. And if our mother is providing so much grace and kindness upon us, we should be grateful and reciprocate. She gives us so many beautiful things to sustain us. We should give back to her. But we'll help her flourish, not to exploit. So this is the concept of simple living high thinking. So with that idea, we started an eco-village. And we're just starting with some nice things. All the bricks from our buildings are from our own soil. There's actually very old traditions that really are nice. They're superior to what we do today in many ways. There's ways of making bricks, and these bricks last hundreds and hundreds of years, at least theoretically, as we're told. I guess after a few hundred years, we'll know for sure. <laughs> but it's just taking the soil from our own ground, wherever we are in the world, and putting some special kind of lime, a little mixture in it, and making it a certain consistency, and then this, uh, what do they call like a press, just to you put it into a mold, and then you pressurize it, it's just, you do it with your hands, and it, presses it into a brick about this big and then you just let it sit in the sunshine for three days and it's a brick and you build with it. And they're really nice. In my opinion, they're better than five star. <laughs> um, and we grow a lot of food. Rice, vegetables, we have some fruit trees. And it's all organic, natural. And we use for plowing. We have a very um, compassionate way of taking care of oxen and bulls. And they, they actually love 
They're strong. They like to use their strength as long as they're not abused and they're loved. So they're really, they're smiling while they're pulling the plows and people are running behind them. And it's, instead of, um, you know, when you use a tractor, you know, there's all kinds of oil, fumes polluting the environment. Well, the oxen, as they're pulling, they, their dung comes out. It actually makes everything more fertile. Very nice. And we have, we really try to focus on water. Um, just a few days ago, Shamsunar and myself, we were at a house and there was a very, very famous Indian um, movie producer and director. He also recently did a very, very famous movie here in Hollywood. And his next movie, he was telling us, is about the future, where water is so desperately required that the mafia, mafias, actually take over the water company. And therefore, the whole of humanity are totally dependent on these people to survive. They select who's going to get water. In fact, even people in the United Nations have expressed a concern that there's been wars over coal, and there's been wars over oil, in the future, there will very likely be wars over water because water shortage is crippling humanity more and more. And yet, we don't see the value of water. If you go to India, to the villages, there's places, they're struggling. They're dying because they just don't have water. There's massive farm lands that are just parched dry because there's just no water. And in many places, there's water during the monsoon seasons. If you don't catch the water and store it, then you're in drought for eight months in a year. taking place in the whole area around where our community is. So we developed this water storage. And we dug this big lake, and it's dug in a special natural way that it catches the water of the monsoons. And when you do that, literally, we have about four lakes like this. One is real big and three are not so big. But it supplies water for the whole eight months after the rainy season. And we don't have to pay anything. It's coming from the sky. It's just a matter of still learning how to keep it. And we had some um, yoga students coming from America in January. The monsoons end in September. And they were asking, they came from America, we were asking, as we were driving here, we saw all the farms, they're so dry. And we see here, everything is so, so much green, and trees, and fruits, and vegetables, and everything's growing, how is this? So it's simple, we just know how to honor and respect what Mother Earth is giving us in the monsoon season, and keep it. Every drop of rain, like a diamond falling from the sky. If we recognize the value of it, we're, not, we're going to take care of it. So now that we've tried to do that, we're, we're giving the same technologies to all the villages around us and helping them to do the same. But nobody trusts you unless you can show an example. So 
song. That's the idea. And another thing about water is sewage. How many people have really meditated on sewage? It's a serious matter because it's universal. Yes? Um, I'm going to get a little disgusting in what I say, but it's important. <laughs> whether you're a billionaire or whether you have nothing, whether you have a PhD or no education, whether you're a Hindu or a Jain or a Zoroastrian or a Muslim or a Christian, or whether you're an agnostic or whether you're an atheist or whether you're male or whether you're female or whether you're from the East or the West, there are certain things we all have in common. <laughs> And one is, we all respond to the call of nature. In other words, we pass urine in school. It, it's like an equalizer. Death is an equalizer. No matter who we are, we're going to die. And similarly, until that comes, Sewage is really crazy. There are rivers all over the world where there's so much sewage dumped in those rivers. The bacteria is so terrible that it causes terrible, great disease. And in a city like Los Angeles, how many gallons of water do you think are flushed on the toilet every day? I heard a statistic for New York City, about one third of all the water in New York City is flushed down toilets. That's precious water. So we had a, one of our students, he was a, studying at IIT, which is the prime um, technological institute college or university in India. And he did his PhD thesis on a natural organic um, sewage processing facility. And we asked him, why don't we set it up in our eco-village? And he did it. And it's really nice. And I'm going to end my talk really soon. Am I talking what you wanted me to talk about? So you flush the toilet, and it goes by gravity and by solar power to a big tank, an open tank. And there it just sits, all the stool and urine and everything else that's mixed with the water, and it just merges so that the solid and the, and the liquid become kind of one. sewage refinery. And then after it all becomes merged like that, then it gets pumped by solar power to a raised area. And then that sewage water goes through various, um, it goes into the ground, and then it comes, it goes through gravity down to the next level. There's seven levels, and in each level there's special traditional roots, rocks, herbs, and plants that actually purify and refine that water. And when it finally comes to the last stage, it's crystal clear, pure water. If you want, you can drink it, but for aesthetic purposes, we don't drink it. <laughs> but it's perfect for cultivating the crops, or it can be put back into the sewage system. It's clean water, so nothing's wasted. But the amazing thing, and I'm going to end with this thought, is we have so many fruit trees, and one of the best crops in that area is papayas. Yes? So we have hundreds of papaya trees on our property. And each, they grow about this big, about an average. But if you go up there to that raised platform where 
the sewage is getting refined, processed. We have all these trees up there too, and the papayas are about this big. They're at least twice as big as any. Yes, Robin, you saw. So when people come, they understand that when they flush their toilets, every time they flush the toilet, the papayas are getting bigger. <laughs> And they're getting sweeter. <laughs> and one of the students of Jiva Mukti Yoga Society was up there and marveling over the taste and the size of the papayas. And this one, she's a yoga teacher. She's she um, she said something that I thought was quite revolutionary. She said, down there, you have so many papayas. But up here, you have poop pies. <laughs> but the idea of these projects is, you know, it's, we're trying to base it on a in, in whatever small ways we can do. When we, by the inspiration and the grace of great personalities, of Bruce, we learn to live in a spirit of compassion rather than selfishness. And that's where real happiness, real and real transformation can take place in ourself and we can be an instrument of that transformation in the world. Those are some of our thoughts. In New Mexico, I went to Guru Devi's Earth Shift House. Is that what you call it? It's incredible. It's um, everything we're speaking about. Thank you. 
couple months ago, I was in Mumbai, and someone was in our, we have a little restaurant connected to our temple called Govindas. And there was a lady there from Switzerland. And she was with one of our friends, one of our congregation. And she was telling me about her and her husband and two of his partners. You may have heard about this. They have actually created solar power airplane. And she said that earlier this year, that airplane flew from San Francisco to New York. It's completely solar powered. And she showed me photographs of it. And she told me about the plane. Um, it's the size of a 7, 747 jumbo jet. Now this is, what do you call a prototype? It's like a beginning. And only two people could fit in it. <laughs> like a little cockpit with a pilot and a co-pilot and the rest of the plane is just covered with solar panels. <laughs> <laughs> and it takes off and it goes into the sky and it goes as high as a regular plane. It goes like 25,000, 30,000 feet above sea level. And the thing is that once it gets above the clouds, there's only sunshine. The only time, once you get above the sunshine, there's never any cloudy days. I mean, once you get above the clouds. So for, throughout the entire day, anywhere you are, it's just sun. And then there's batteries. And it charges the batteries enough so you're charged for the whole night. So literally, you can fly in this plane for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years and never have to land. And they've done it in such an ecological way that they have a machine there. It's a real natural kind of little machine. Because water is a problem. So you pass urine in this thing, she's telling you this. And it makes it into crystal clear, pure water. So you just keep recycling. You drink your urine, and it becomes nice water, and then you drink it, and then it becomes urine, and then you drink it, and then this way you never have to come down. <laughs> um, some things have to be improved. She said, it will fly from Los Angeles to Tokyo. I said, how long does it take? She said, it takes eight days. <laughs> so, you know, you have to be a little patient. <laughs> but the fact that people are thinking this way, you know, utilizing our human intelligence to actually think in this way, because when the Wright brothers invented the first airplane, it was kind of with bicycle wheels and pedals and stuff like that. And it was a lot less sophisticated than this. So the fact that you know they're actually thinking this way is if we just invest time and energy in, into these natural ways of <laughs> living in harmony with nature rather than in contrast with the well-being of humanity and all beings. Wonderful things will happen. minutes of cure time? Is that <laughs> this cure time is in the path of bhakti. The great gift we have received, these divine transcendental vibrations of these mantras. <laughs> Thank you.
awake and the true potential. Satchitananda, our eternal nature. teach you how, since ancient times, this chanting has been done in a way that everyone comes together joyfully. Would you like to learn? Everyone please stand up.